Hey guys, in this investigation on electromagnetic waves, here we are in the most important lesson of this course, invoking the displacement current concept and hence leading to Maxwell's equations. Let's start with something that we already know from last lesson. In 1821, Hans Christian Ørsted proved experimentally that when you pass an electric current through a conducting wire, you produce a magnetic effect as a result of it, which affects other mag a magnetic needle kept in its vicinity. On the basis of Ørsted's experiment, Ampere in France formulated a simple yet powerful mathematical formula to measure the magnetic field around a current carrying conductor. Meanwhile, Michael Faraday had observed these field lines to curl around the conductor in concentric circles as seen here. The current going in this direction, the magnetic field goes anticlockwise. The, magnetic, the current is coming out of the paper where each consecutive outer circle represents a weaker magnetic field strength. Now this is from Biot-Savart's law which, which says that the magnetic field strength around a current element goes down as 1 by r square, which is exactly what you would expect if this was in the case of electric field, which, in the, which as the distance increases from the source, the electric charge, the electric field goes down as the inverse square law predicts. Now, Ampere's law, which he formulated to measure the magnetic field around a current carrying conductor, can be written as follows, which is the closed line integral of B dot DL is equal to mu naught, which is the permeability of free space, and the, sur the open surface integral of J dot DS, where J is the current density is the surface current density, which is the number of charges that flow through a unit surface area per unit time, current per unit time, that is J. Or it can also be written in a simpler fashion as the closed line integral of B dot EL is equal to mu naught I pen, where I pen is the current penetrating through an arbitrary open surface attached to a closed loop around which you are trying to measure the magnetic field. Now, by symmetry operations, you can always take the closed loop as a circle or anything that you might find to be the simplest in your particular case. But in this case, the closed loop is an exact circle and at every point on the circumference of the circle, the, the magnetic field strength is the same. Now our motive to find out why we needed a displacement current term in the Maxwell's equations is going, is going to take us through a small journey here. We're going to do some experiments and some imagination, some thought experiments to find out the magnetic field strength at the point P shown here at a distance R from the center of the current carrying wire, which is the radius of the circular loop. The first case is we are going to consider the gray surface here, the S1 surface, as the open surface attached to the closed loop which is shown by this black outline around here. And the second case we are going to consider the surface S2 which is this light reddish surface which is the second option which is the second uh, iteration, the surface that we will also consider in, in trying to measure the magnetic field at point P. Now in case 1, we get the magnetic field strength as we might expect from Biot-Savart's law as well, which is equal to mu naught I pen, the penetrating current, divided by 2 pi r. The magnetic field strength goes down as 1 by r as you go away from the current carrying wire. Now this is exactly what we have found in the past using Biot-Savart's law. Ampere's law gives you the same result, which is cool. But in case 2, we get the field strength as 0 
because there is no current which penetrates through the S2 surface at any point. Now this is a contradiction. How can the field strength be both zero and this at the same time? This suggests that there's, there's something missing in Ampere's formulation. A general application of ampere circuital law must account for an arbitrary choice of an open surface attached to the closed loop around which the integral is carried out on the LHS, the B dot DL term. Now this disturbed one particular physicist in Scotland, in the United Kingdom, James Clerk Maxwell, who was a professor at the University of Edin Edinburgh, but at that time, when this was being uh, worried over, he was at King's College London, a very good friend of Michael Faraday, who was also a part, uh, an integral part of the Royal Society of London. He proposed a modification to the RHS term in order to preserve the original form of the equation on the grounds of symmetry, acknowledging his friend Faraday's contribution which said that a changing magnetic field induces an electric field Maxwell suggested that a time varying electric field must also give rise to a magnetic field does it he he proposed and he also proved it considering s2 as our open surface as long as we are passing a dc current to the capacitor plates as you pass the dc current the capacitor plates keep on charging until they are completely charged. At that time, there is no more uh, buildup of charge on the capacitor plates. So whatever you are passing, there is no extra number of charges which are getting built up on the capacitor plates. Now, as a, as a result, from time t is equal to zero till the point when the capacitor plates are charged, the amount of current passing to the capacitor plates is increasing, is, is changing with time. And as a result of this, there are more and more charges after each instant on the capacitor plates, as a result of which the electric field strength increases with time as the transient current increases in its magnitude. Now the electric flux which is changing in time is given by E dot A where E is electric field between the capacitor plates and A is the area of cross section of the capacitor plates where E is given by Gauss law sigma by epsilon naught where sigma is a surface charge density and A the cross section area. We know that capacitors have infinite resistance for DC current but for transient charging or discharging cycles the charge on the plates and consequently the electric field changes with time as well. Now this is for DC currents. What do you think would be the case for AC currents where the electric field is always changing in time? Imagine, think about it. I want you to th think about what will happen in the case of AC currents. We'll come to that later. As a result of the changing electric field, there is a unique type of current between the capacitor plates, which is quantified as the rate of change of electric flux, or given by 1 by epsilon naught dq dt, where in the last slide we saw that phi e is sigma by epsilon naught into a, where sigma is q by a, so a in the denominator and a in the numerator are going to cancel out, so you will have just Q by epsilon naught. So rate of change of electric flux is nothing but 1 by epsilon naught dQ dt, where dQ dt is the current. is not just the normal current that we are used to, it's a special type of current, which we shall call the displacement current, given by epsilon naught d phi e by dt. Now this was proposed as the missing piece in Ampere's law on the right hand side in addition to the penetrating to the current in the wire and it was proven to be true by Maxwell. Now I have changed how the title looks in this slide because there is 
really no displacement that occurs that has been proved so far. Now Maxwell assumed that perhaps it ref the displacement, the, the current that is seen, perhaps it refers to the progressive displacement of localized charges in the dielectric, usually occupying the space between the capacitor plates. Now due to polarization as a result of charge buildup, this fueled the idea of empty space being filled by a ubiquitous luminiferous ether medium, the theory of which was later scrapped as a result of the Michelson-Morley experiment in 1887. But the terminology displacement current stuck. Now Michelson-Morley, according to their result, they found that the, the speed of light was invariant of whether we were traveling in the direction of Earth's motion around the sun, in which case the ether would be dragged along. And it was also measured with the, the speed of light was also measured to be the same in the transverse direction. So they proved that there was no ether actually, which was corroborated by Einstein in his theory of special relativity, suggested he suggested that there is no such thing as a luminous first ether, as propounded by Maxwell. Now Maxwell didn't live long enough to know this experimental result, so we can't really blame him for being jumpy for proposing it. Now the interpretation of displacement current is still a hot topic of debate today, but its inclusion resulted in resolving the existing discrepancies in the theory of electrodynamics. Now this diagram shows you how polarization would have affected the displacement current. But if there is vacuum in between the capacitor plates, there is no polarization. There is no uh, displacement of charges. So what is happening? What is this electric displacement? The relation between electric displacement current and the electric displacement is given by this equation here. The electric displacement given by this e equation seen earlier is also represented as this equation shown here where the epsilon is just taken inside. This epsilon naught E in the case of vacuum being the medium is the electric displacement. So this electric displacement epsilon naught E is changing in time which is a, an interpretation of the displacement current where D is generally expressed as epsilon naught E plus P where P would be only invoked in the case of a real dielectric in between the capacitor plates and also expressed as epsilon naught 1 plus epsilon r E where epsilon r is a dielectric constant. Now the inclusion of this displacement current completed the whole theory of classical electrodynamics and gave rise to the four Maxwell's equations as seen here which is the Gauss law of electrostatics, the Gauss law of magnetostatics, faraday lenz law, and the Ampere-Maxwell law, along with Maxwell's contribution in it. These four equations form the foundation of classical electrodynamics. And it is possible to do some mathematical operations upon these equations, mainly these two, the last two, which was done by Maxwell giving rise to a distinctive wave equation, a wave equation predicting waves associated with electric and magnetic field oscillations with an accurate prediction of a wave velocity to be 299792458 meters per second in vacuum or air, which is remarkably close to the experimental measurements of the speed of light measured by many people earlier. Now this was a prediction that electromagnetic waves and light are nothing but the same. Finally, I encourage you to look for other situations where displacement current is very crucial to invoke. Thank you for listening.